This is your one-stop shop to everything you need to know before you travel to the other side of the world by yourself. A few months ago, I decided I wanted to move to Australia, but I had absolutely no idea how to do it. So I just decided to book a one-way plane ticket with pretty much zero plans. Yeah, that was pretty terrifying. But that's why I made this video, so if you're in a similar situation, you won't have to feel the way I did, because I'm gonna lay out everything that I wish I knew before I traveled to Australia. Literally everything that I stressed about and didn't know how to do, I'm just gonna cover in this massive, chunky, elaborate video, so I hope you're ready for it. To give you some context, a few months ago, I kinda got stuck in this rut of doing the same things over and over, stressing myself out too much, and I just really felt like I needed a change of pace. And ultimately, I decided I wanted to try solo traveling. And I realized this is an incredibly privileged thing that I was able to do, and not everyone is in the same situation as me. I saved up as much money as I could and used that during my travels. I also had the intention of working in Australia as well. I am incredibly grateful that this is something I was able to do. And naturally, I was terrified because I'm moving to the other side of the world by myself. Long story short, I ended up backpacking for about two and a half months, all the way up the East Coast, starting from Melbourne up to Cairns. And then for about another month after that, I kind of stuck around assessing the job situation, deciding if I wanted to stay and work there or not. That trip to Australia was one of the best experiences of my life, so I'm gonna just break down exactly what I did, how I did it, and what I would do differently. So I'm gonna warn you now, this is gonna be a chunky video. I don't know how long it's gonna be, but there's a lot of information I have to share, and it's gonna be helpful if you are actually going to Australia. So you know, take out a pen and notepad or write some notes on your phone because there's some um, important stuff that you probably want to take note of. Okay, so the things we're going to cover, number one is about planning your trip before you go, about your visas, your plane tickets, when's the best season to go, things like that. And number two is how to actually plan your trip itself. Three is going to be how to pack, and I packed so wrong, and so this is really, really important. Number four is the exact path that I took, starting from Melbourne, working my way up to Cairns, and my favorite places to stop along the way, ranking all of them. Five is a bit about the Australian culture and how it differs from American culture. Six is about hostel life and what it's actually like to be living in a hostel, because that was a totally new experience for me. Seven is about budgeting, saving money, how much money I spent and all this stuff. So if there's any of these you wanna jump to, I'll have chapters linked for each of them so you can skip to the part that's most interesting to you. But honestly, if you're backpacking in Australia for at least a couple months, the whole video is probably going to be pretty useful. Okay, the first thing, once you've made the decision to go to Australia, is to figure out your intention for going and what visa you want. If you want to go just as a holiday, as a vacation, to travel, enjoy yourself, you should just go get the tourist visa. The tourist visa is typically three months long, but it can be extended to 12 months. The second visa you can get is the work holiday visas, and there's two of them. If you're from the US and some other countries that I'll put up here, you'll get the work and holiday visa. Um, subclass 462. And if you're from the UK and some other countries I'll put here, you'd get the working holiday visa, which is subclass 417. Pretty much the same visa. The US version is has a little teeny bit more restrictions, but it's not really enough that it matters, in my opinion. You get the visa for a 12 month period and it costs 635 AUD. You have to be between the ages of 18 and 30. You can only get this visa once and you can go to Australia for 12 months to work pretty much as much as you want. The only restriction is you can only work for one employer for up to six months. And then after six months, you have to switch employers. And that visa you can actually extend to up to three years if you do regional work. If you want your second year, you have to do 88 days of regional work, which basically means you have to work in a really remote area. Most people end up doing farm work for 88 days. And then for the third year, you have to do even more days of farm work. It's a really cool opportunity because you can literally go to Australia and live there for up to three years. And if you're from Britain, there's just been a change in this policy where you don't have to do any farm work at all, I believe and you can get up to three years. I can link a video down below if you want more information on that. And all the information about these visas can be found at the Australian Home Affairs website. I'll also link that down below. And the application is also pretty simple. You have to, I think, take a picture of your driver's license and or passport, put in some information about yourself, and it gets accepted really quick. Next important thing is when to go on your trip. It's definitely important to research 
what seasons are best to go traveling in Australia um, because the weather can be pretty intense sometimes in certain areas. So look at where you're gonna be traveling to and see when the best season is to go there. For me, I started in Melbourne in February, ended up in Cairns in May. So, and that was a pretty good time to go. March, April, May is when the weather on the East Coast is pretty nice. Also October, November is tends to be pretty good. When the weather's better, there's also just gonna be a lot more travelers, so keep that in mind. It's kind of fun when there's more travelers because you have more people to socialize with, but also things get booked up a lot quicker, but I would definitely recommend going within either their spring or their autumn. Once you got your visa figured out and you know when you wanna go to Australia, then you just gotta book the flight, right? This is the scariest part. I don't know what it is about this. It's the moment you are actually committing to going to Australia, and it's it was so scary for me. I remember my heart racing and then I like press the button. I was like, ah, I'm going, it's real. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I just booked my tickets to Australia. Flights to Australia from the US are so expensive. I recommend using one of those like cheap flight finder apps like Skyscanner, I think there's a few others too. So make sure to do some research. Google Flights is also good, but use an incognito browser so that the prices won't go up on you over time. And my last piece of advice for this planning section is it's scary because this is like your time of commitment, like you've been talking about, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, it never feels real, and then all of a sudden you book your flight, you get your visa, and you're like, oh my God, this is real now, and it's terrifying. At least for me it was, but coming from someone who did it, it's not as scary as you think it will be. Stressing yourself out over it doesn't make the situation any better. Once you've committed, you've committed, and now it's happening. Yeah, just, just enjoy the journey. Step two is to plan your entire journey, which I did not. So there, there's two options. You could do what I did or you could plan it all. So I'll go over both options. Option number one, my first week in Melbourne, I joined a travel group. The travel group is called Welcome to Travel. They basically take a bunch of young people, ages like 18 to 30, usually like young 20s, and it's pretty much everyone's first time in Australia. So they help you set up a SIM card, they help you get a bank account, they help you figure out the bus system, and then they show you around the city and you get to experience all the different things. You get to meet this really cool group of people from all over the world, and the way that Welcome to Travel does it is they're also a travel travel agency. So I sat down with one of the travel agents at the end of that week for like two hours and mapped out literally everything I wanted to do and they booked everything for me like from the hostels to the excursions to the activities and transportation they booked everything all at once so I literally did not have to think about that for two months. I have a video all about my first week when I first got to Australia in Melbourne and my experience doing that welcome to travel group. And if that's something you're interested in doing, I also have a promo code where you can get $50 off of your tour with them um, using the code Maddie 50 So I'll link that here, link that down below too. And the good thing about that is it really helps when you have no idea what the heck you're doing in Australia. It helps because they often have some discounts. They like work with some of the companies and they can get you discounts for some of the places. And it's it's helpful because they do all the work for you. So it's a lot less stress and less pressure off of your shoulders. You kind of are automatically forced into this like giant friend group. The one downside I would say is you have a little bit less flexibility because you have, to, if you need to change your dates or reschedule something or cancel something, you have to go through them and then they have to go through the company. So it takes a bit more time for things to kind of get rescheduled and they charge a little bit of a fee for that for some of them. But if that flexibility is really, really important to you, I'll tell you all of my tips that I learned from traveling where if I were to do it again um, and I were to book everything myself, this is what I would do. And the second option would be to book everything yourself. And if you are gonna book everything yourself, I would say the number one tip is to book everything in advance. I'm talking at least like one to two months in advance, especially during their busy travel seasons because things get booked up so fast. So if that's something that you're gonna do, then I would book everything literally before you go on your trip. Whew, it's getting hot. Number three is how to pack correctly, and I did so much wrong when I did this. So I thought when you're backpacking, you need a backpack because why else would they call it backpacking, right? Well, in most countries, you should use a backpack, apparently, but in Australia, a backpack isn't really necessary because everywhere there's like paved roads and sidewalks, so you can kind of like use a suitcase everywhere if you want to. I if I were to do it over again, would bring about half the amount of things that I brought 
or bring a suitcase. I had some friends who use suitcases and it worked out really well for them. But either way, you'll make it work and it's not the end of the world if you pick one or the other. So some general packing tips is less is more. I thought I packed the best way that I could have. But then when I got to Australia, I was like, holy crap, my backpack is so freaking heavy, I can't do this. Within the first two weeks, I ended up ditching like a bit, pretty much like a duffel bag worth of stuff. And then later on, I ended up shipping even more stuff home. I'll link a video down below Low to give you a bit of a sense of what you really need. This video helps me when packing, but I would say really, really take it to heart and don't bring more than what this video says. For example, at home, I wear leggings every single day and I have three of the exact same pair of Lululemon leggings that I absolutely love and I wear them every day. So I was like, absolutely, I need to bring three pairs of Lululemon leggings. Don't bring multiples of clothing. I also brought like a hot pink jacket that only ever goes with like one outfit if I go out. And I ditched that jacket too. I literally just like left it in a hostel because I was like, I love that jacket, but like I didn't have space for it. The number one thing when packing is versatility. Like bring a pair of shoes that you can wear day to day. Maybe another pair of shoes that you go hiking with. Maybe you can bring two. Like bring one jacket, two bikinis. Actually, the one thing you should bring two of is towels. Bring two microfiber towels because one you're gonna want to use for the beach and then one for the shower. I also brought a jump rope because I thought I was gonna use it, but I ended up exercising more by like going on hikes and surfing and going outdoors than, you know, staying in the gym and jump roping. One thing to note is your lifestyle will change. So bringing things that fit your lifestyle right now might not be relevant when you move. Oh, one other thing that I really wish I brought was a hanging makeup holder. Okay, on to my favorite part, which is all the places I went and I'm gonna rank them all for you. So if you're scheduling all this yourself, make sure to take notes. And even if you're not and you wanna book with a travel agency, think about what places sound most exciting to you. So the path I took was I started in Melbourne and then I basically made my way all the way up the East Coast, taking the Greyhound bus. And you'll be surprised with how spread out each city is. Like I had, I think at least three overnight buses. People think of Australia as small, but it's actually really big. A lot of Australia is still very like agricultural, but I'm gonna be kind of covering from Melbourne to Cairns. Melbourne, I'd rank about an eight out of 10. The city is so cool. It's so lively. There's so much art and culture and live music and there's like really cool hole in the wall like bars and clubs and it's just like vibey. It is a city, like it's very much a city but it's just like a very lively city. It, it was a bit overwhelming because I hadn't spent that much time in big cities before but um, it was a really cool city to start the adventure in. I would say though the weather kind of sucks there. When I got there it was like 104 degrees Fahrenheit um, which is like, I don't know, like 40 Celsius or something. It was so hot. I had friends who went back like a couple months later and it was just like cold, like really, really cold there. So the weather is not the best and it's not by really any nice beaches. So that's where I did the Welcome to Travel tour. Um, I'll link that video down below if you wanna check it out. I also went to Phillip Island, which was so cool. I got to pet kangaroos and go surfing and that was probably the highlight of my like Melbourne um, tour trip. After that trip with my Welcome to Travel group, they give you the option to continue your journey with some of those group members to do the Great Ocean Road. And that's like a four day road trip where you kind of travel a little bit um, south and west. Um, along the coast and you get to see these really nice beaches and go on some beautiful hikes and see some really really pretty well-known Australian like sightseeing spots and some really cool surf towns and I would rate that trip about a 7, 7.5. The sights were so gorgeous and like some of the cliffs and the beaches and these like giant rocks in the ocean and it's just like it looks surreal but i will say i was in a car with eight people and we were driving a lot of the time after like the 10th giant rock you've seen it doesn't look as cool as the first giant rock that you see and on this trip i saw a koala outside of one of the hostels i was staying at and that like just made my whole australian journey after that took a bus up to sydney which I got picked up to do a surf camp. And the surf camp was at Seven Mile Beach, which is in Daroa. And it was 
10 out of 10. I loved the surf camp. I think it, this was my favorite part of my whole Australian trip because surfing was something that I really wanted to learn how to do and it was a five day camp where that's literally all you did. Um, the vibes were just like immaculate and everyone was so nice and friendly and chill and we just got to like surf and and eat food. I have a video all about how I learned to surf in five days. I'll link that down below also. After surf camp, I went back to Sydney and stayed there for about five days. I'd rate Sydney about an eight out of 10. I think Sydney is beautiful and has incredible beaches um, and some really pretty sites like the Opera House was so pretty and it like lights up at night. Make sure to go to Bondi and Coogee. Those are like really nice beaches and also Manly Beach. I didn't end up going there, but I've heard really, really good things about it. Also doing the coastal walk from Bondi to Coogee is really pretty. I like the vibe of the city. It's just like light and fresh, a bit more corporate feeling. If you're into health and fitness, Bondi is definitely the place to go. There's a lot of fit, attractive people in Bondi. If you go to Sydney, I also highly recommend the Blue Mountains. I did a tour. I don't think you necessarily need a tour to go there. You can just like take the bus or the train there and there's a bunch of really cool, gorgeous hikes that you could do. Just spend a day and do some hikes. Um, or you could spend a few days and stay at a hostel there, which I had a friend who did that and she really enjoyed it. After that, I continued my way up the East Coast and went to Byron Bay. Byron Bay, I'd rate a 9.5 out of 10. I really liked Byron Bay. When you ask most backpackers where their favorite place Place that they've been in Australia is, I would say like 90% of them say Byron Bay. It's such a cute little surfing town. The beaches are so gorgeous. They have the prettiest sunrises and sunsets. The almost like a hippie surfer kind of vibe. People just don't wear shoes in stores or shirts sometimes. We walk around in bikinis and little sarongs. There's like a lot of really cool live music on the streets sometimes. There's this piano bar that is epic. It's so much fun. The only downside I have to Byron Bay is it is touristy. Uh, a lot of people know that Byron Bay is so cute and so it's a, a bit more expensive to book hostels or just stay, your stay in Byron Bay. The next stop up the east coast is Surfer's Paradise or Gold Coast and I actually didn't stop there because I had it in my itinerary and then I loved Byron Bay so much I decided to cancel going to Gold Coast and stay in Byron Bay for like an extra two or three days. But the general consensus from people that I've talked to is it's cool if you want to go there for a couple days and party it up and you know maybe go and try a surf lesson. It's gorgeous but it can get old quickly. People call it like the Miami of Australia. I've also heard people refer to it kind of like Vegas vibes. It's huge on surf, huge on partying. They also have the zoo and the Warner Brothers studios and some amusement parks there so if you're into that you'll like this place even more. Next up the East Coast is Brisbane and Brisbane is one of the other major cities in Australia. Based on my experiences it seems that Brisbane is really good for job opportunities um, but in my opinion the city itself didn't feel too extra special to me. It just kind of felt like a big city. I've met lots of people who love Brisbane. Maybe I didn't stay there long enough to fully appreciate it, but based on like my experience, I'd rate it like a 5.5. Really good for job opportunities. Some people love it, but it wasn't really for me. But I will say that Brisbane is totally worth going to if you go to Morton Island. It's like a 30 minute ferry ride outside of Brisbane and it's the island that the Scooby-Doo Spooky Island was filmed. I did a, a day tour where I went kayaking in these really cool clear kayaks and then went snorkeling in this like epic shipwreck and then we went sandboarding. You climb up these giant like sand dunes and you literally hold these boards and you go head first down these giant sand dunes. So scary but so much fun. That experience in Morton Island I'd rate like 9 out of 10. That was so 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 fun. It's only a day though but I highly recommend that. Continuing upwards then I went to Noosa and Noosa is like Byron Bay's bougier older cousin. It's such a pretty town. The surf is really good. The weather is also good for most of the year, I think. It's really fun to be there when you're staying at a fun hostel with a lot of people. It doesn't have the same vibe that Byron Bay does. It has a bit more of like a sophisticated, older, bougier, rich person vibe, which is, I felt a bit out of place. <laughs> 
And if you're going there and staying in a hostel, I highly recommend either Bounce or Nomads. Bounce is so nice, like a luxury resort. Nomads is really, really fun because that's where all the fun night events are held. After that, I went to Rainbow Beach and that is a teeny, teeny, tiny little beach town. It's really cute, but there's like nothing there. But the only reason I went there was to go to Fraser Island. That was such a cool experience. It's one of the most dangerous islands in the world. I made a whole video about my experience there. The weather was not the best when I went there, so I would give it like a 7 out of 10, but I've had friends who had really good weather and would probably give it like a 9 or 10 out of 10. It's a really, really cool experience. I highly recommend it. You get to drive in the sand and it's so fun. We got to drive into the rainforest to get to our first destination. Our next stop was a giant shipwreck. It looked even more incredible up in person. We walked up a giant sand dune and got a picture all together and then all sat around a campfire with drinks and roasting marshmallows. After that, I went up to Airlie Beach and stayed there for a little while because that's where I did the Wit Sundays. Airlie Beach itself is a cute little town. There's not much to do. I'd give it like a six out of 10. It's bigger than Rainbow Beach. You also can't go in the water because once you pass, I think it's around like Rainbow Beach area, the water is infested with like jellyfish and crocodiles and it's not good to go into. But the Wit Sundays, I'd rate a 9.5 out of 10. That was so fun and so gorgeous. The views that I saw on the Wit Sundays tour were the prettiest views I have seen. Whitehaven Beach was the prettiest beach I've ever seen in my entire life. The the Wit Sundays tour I did, you get on a boat with like 30 other people and you spend two nights on the boat and travel around to all these really, really pretty islands. You get to go snorkeling. You have to wear sting suits because there's jellyfish in the water. But everybody just gets like not drunk drunk, but like fun tipsy. If you get seasick, make sure to bring uh, motion sickness pills and you are sleeping with 30 other people in like one room. So you're kind of like packed like sardines in there. So that's the other thing that's not ideal. But aside from that, it's so worth it. The food is great. They cook everything for you. Like it's just, it's really fun. After that, I went to Magnetic Island. Magnetic Island was so fun because I got to rent a scooter and some people rent these like really cool giant Barbie cars, but I rented a scooter and went up and down all of these roads and beaches. They have what they call rock wallabies, which are little wallabies like this big who go and you find them in rocks and you can go up to them and pet them and feed them and it's so cool. I think it's called the, the Forts Walk or Fort Walk and you get to do this like little walk and see koalas. I saw some kangaroos. There's one hostel that if you go to it at a certain time, they uh, do bird feedings and so you can literally put food on your hand and the birds will come up and like eat the food from you. And the only downside to the island is, well, when I went there, it was so, so, so humid and hot. The other thing is if you don't rent a car or a scooter, you can't really get around. They don't have that great of a bus system. The island's small and there's not much to do other than what's at your hostel. So I stayed at Nomads, which a lot of people stayed there and they have fun events every night. After that, I went to Mission Beach and Mission Beach is another tiny town. I wouldn't stay there for long because I don't think there's much to do, but if you're looking to just chill and relax, it's a good place to go. But the reason I went to Mission Beach was to go skydiving. I'd give skydiving like a 10 out of 10. Um, and doing it in Mission Beach, I think from what people have told me is the prettiest place to do it in Australia because you get to basically go and fly above and see the Great Barrier Reef and then land with your feet in the sand. I have a video about my experience skydiving also, so I'll, I'll link that video down below too. Some people also go whitewater rafting here, so if you are looking into doing that, Mission Beach is the place to do it. After that, I went to Cairns and I would say that was about a five out of 10. I stayed there for way too long. I was there for about two weeks, maybe. If you're looking to party, Karen does a place to go and stay at Gilligan's because it's like a giant frat house. It's huge and there's three clubs attached to it. So when you sleep, depending on the room you get, at least when I was sleeping, I could hear the base of the club I was next to until 2 a.m. in the morning, so much that the entire bed would shake, like the doors would rattle, but it was really cheap. So for the price that I paid, it wasn't too bad to be honest. And I think like the further up north you get, the more and more things that can kill you. And Cairns is pretty much the furthest up north that you can go. It's also pretty remote. My laptop actually broke when I was in 
and Cairns. And if I wanted to get my data recovered, I'd have to go all the way back down to Brisbane. The cool thing about Cairns is the nature and the rainforest. So I did um, a Daintree rainforest tour. I only did a one day tour, but I know some people who did a two day tour and they loved it so much more. Um, you basically get to stay in the rainforest and see cool spiders and snakes and crocodiles. Oh, and waterfalls too. The people who I've talked to who did it loved the overnight one. You can also go scuba dive in the Great Barrier Reef and I did that as well, but I don't have my scuba certification. So it was like an intro dive. So I basically went down with an instructor and like four other intro divers and we kind of had to hold on to the instructor the entire time. But if you're looking to get certified, there's definitely places to do it in Cairns. Scuba diving the Great Barrier Reef itself, it was really cool, but Honestly, it was, I think, a bit overrated. I didn't really see anything that much cooler than I did when I was snorkeling. I also snorkeled in pretty much the same spot. If you do have your scuba certification, you're able to go down a lot further and will likely be able to see more than I did. For me, the scuba diving views that I saw were really similar to the views I saw snorkeling the Great Barrier Reef and were comparable to snorkeling in Morton Island and the Whit Sundays, which were both absolutely stunning. So this isn't to say that you shouldn't experience a Great Barrier Reef because it is beautiful. So that was a path I took from Melbourne to Cairns, and I know I spent a lot of time going over that, but I hope that helps some of you. The next thing I wanna cover is a bit about Australian culture and how it differs from the US culture. And to be honest, it's pretty similar in a lot of ways. It's a westernized society, so there's not that much that's different, but the overall feel of Australians is a bit more relaxed, a bit more chill, and a bit more like raw and real. Being in California, I think that there's a lot of people who can kind of come off a bit superficial. In Australia, I think you get a little bit less of that. You get people like swearing and cussing more, saying I think more of what they feel than what might be appropriate to say. Australians also seem to have a better view of work-life balance. Their work week is 38 hours compared to ours is 40. And the way that I see it is Australians work to live while a lot of Americans live to work. So they have a job and they go to work. Some of them like their job, some of them don't, but their life revolves outside of work. I'm obviously like overgeneralizing a lot here, but I think Americans seem to care a bit more about how much money they make, the status of their job, how their position in the job, all of that kind of stuff. Whereas Australians care about that too, but um, I think a little bit to a, a lesser extent. Tradey jobs are actually really highly viewed in Australia and they're not highly viewed in the US from what I know. Australians are also, from what I've experienced, a bit more reckless. Um, they just like do crazy stuff all the time and they're just spontaneous and down to do whatever. They also drink a lot. A lot of Australians also have mullets and mustaches and tattoos, so get used to that. The first thing that most people say when I told them that I was going to Australia was, oh my God, how are you gonna deal with the giant spiders and everything that kills you? So in reality, yeah, there's big spiders. The majority of like the big spiders are in more rural areas, but you don't see them that often in big cities. And the big spiders aren't the ones that really hurt you. The, the little ones that you don't really see are the ones that are actually venomous. I only saw one snake the whole time I was there. There's definitely things that kill you, but if you have common sense, you will be fine. It wasn't something that I was ever worried about or scared about being there. The cool thing is though that there are kangaroos and wallabies and koalas out in the wild. Another weird culture thing is that Australians don't really tip. So you go to a restaurant or a bar or anything like that and you're not expected to give a tip, which is really, really different than American culture. And I think the one thing that was just hardest for me was just learning that people act different. Like you're literally in a different country, you're playing by a different country's rules. So like you have to learn to let go a little bit and be open-minded and learn how the other country functions and what their culture is like and try to adapt to it. You are a guest. Moving on from Australian culture to hostel culture and the two are pretty different because you don't meet many Australians in the hostels themselves and I was actually surprised I didn't meet many Americans in the hostels either. I met um, I'd say the biggest portion was from the UK, a lot of countries from Europe. There's a bunch of Germans. I also met some people from the Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, they're kind of everywhere. It's such a mash of all these different cultures coming together and it's really fun. You get to meet people from all over the world. Hostile life just breeds friendship. <laughs> and maybe those friendships last a day, maybe they last a year, maybe they last for a lifetime. But literally you could be walking into your hostel room the first time with all of your bags and everything and be invited on a night out. Like it's really, really inclusive, really 
fun. A lot of people are outgoing. Everyone just wants to make friends. Everyone wants to just have a good time. Um, it's really easy to make friends in your dorm room. One thing I will note though is you will make friends and there's gonna be a part of you that wants to stick with that friend. If that happens and you meet someone that you totally vibe with, you know, spend time with them, have a good time, but I don't recommend changing your plans for someone until maybe a little bit down the line. So you're probably gonna have one or two months booked out because of how far in advance you have to book stuff in Australia. If you try and change your plans last minute, it's gonna be really hard to find things and rebook things last minute again, and I find it's also harder to make friends when you come to a new place with friends already. I plan my East Coast trip, you know, traveling north, and there's a lot of people who are doing the same exact thing that I was. I was technically traveling by myself, but I would meet people along the way. So I would meet people at one hostel, be friends with them, hang out with them for a couple days, then I'd move on to the next hostel, and then I would see them, like, you know, maybe a week or two later at this other hostel up the East Coast, and then I'd see other friends at a different hostel up the East Coast, and so you keep running into people you know all the time because everyone's doing that same trip. In backpacking culture in Australia, drinking is huge. Like, everyone wants to go out every night of the week. So you have to decide what nights you want to go out and what nights you need to take for yourself because if you don't take nights for yourself, you're going to end up burning yourself to the ground and getting sick. It sucks being in a hostel and being sick. So take care of yourself. Goon is Australian's version of boxed wine. It's not that bad, but it's not that good either. It's cheap, which is why a lot of backpackers like to drink it. If you're from America and you're traveling outside the country, be prepared that everyone just hates America and hates Americans. But Honestly, I should have just started telling people I was from Canada. Everyone loves Canada. When people heard my accent, they would actually ask me if I was from Canada before the US because they didn't want to offend me if I was Canadian. A tip about the hostels that you stay in, um, if you book through a travel agency, they're probably going to give you the best hostels to stay at. But if you don't, then I would recommend downloading the app Hostel World and doing some research on the ones that get the best reviews. Don't stay at hostels that get bad reviews just because they're cheap. Staying at hostels that are bigger, you just have a better chance of meeting more people, making more friends, so it's more fun when the hostels are a little bit bigger. Some of my favorite hostels I've stayed at um, were Wake Up. Uh, they have, I stayed at one in Sydney and one in Byron Bay. They're both really good. YHA is also pretty good. Um, I stay, and those are usually pretty cheap too. If you go to Melbourne, Space Hostel is probably the best hostel I ever stayed at. It's so nice. Nomads is also a pretty good option. Usually it's a bit cheaper, but it's also pretty popular. They also usually do really fun events at Nomads. And the last thing about hostel life is you really do have to put an effort if you want to stay in contact with people because you make a lot of friends um, meeting people at hostels and you kind of have to pick and choose which people you really want to stay in contact with or else you'll just lose contact with them. Like I've met dozens of people and like I would have called them my friends at different points along my trip, but I'm not in contact with a lot of them anymore, and so you gotta put in the effort or else it's you're gonna lose that friendship. Okay, we're almost there. Let's talk money. So, before you go to Australia, you obviously wanna have some money saved up. They actually require you to have at least 5,000 Australian dollars in your bank account before you go to Australia. And how much you spend is really up to you. Hostels can vary a ton from like $20 a night to 60 plus dollars a night. And then also a huge part of it is drinking. If you're gonna be drinking a lot, that's gonna be costing a lot more money. Um, are you gonna be eating out a lot? Are you gonna be cooking your meals? I would recommend cooking a lot of your meals with friends. Welcome to Travel has a budget guide that I kind of used to help me figure out how much money I needed to have saved up. So I'll link that below too. That helped me a little bit when I was planning my trip. Some tips that I have to save money are, number one, if you are a drinker and you're gonna go out and drink, drink cheaply. So if you can drink Goon, which is really cheap boxed wine, before you go out, you're gonna buy less drinks when you go out. Cook more meals with friends. You can also plan your meals ahead of time. So I got bread and eggs and ate that every morning for breakfast. I also got a lot of like apples and bananas. Those are really cheap fruit foods. A lot of people eat pasta. But when it came down to it for me, anytime I was like at a store and I was like, oh, that's a really cute top, I would look at it and think, do I have space for this in my backpack? And then I would think, no, I don't, so then I wouldn't get the top. <laughs> yeah, you probably don't have space for a lot of stuff anyway, um, so just try not to buy unnecessary things. I also got a Greyhound bus pass that I think was like 300 something dollars and it allowed me to travel pretty much anywhere in Australia on the East Coast using the bus as many times as I wanted and it just had an expired date. It saved me a ton of 
money when I was traveling because that was how I got from literally every location to the other. So getting a bus pass for like three months is really, really convenient. Something that I didn't think about until like my last couple weeks in Australia was if you have a following on any social media, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, literally anything, you can utilize that to try and get discounts or um, free stays at some hostels. And a lot of hostels just want promotion and they will be willing to do it. It helps if you're not in their busy tourist season so they wouldn't be losing money. If you are wanting to take like a bit of a break and you feel like you just need a few days of just like downtime, try and book those downtime days in cheaper hostels. Like find some of the smaller beach towns and book your days there so you'll be saving a bit of money and you'll be just kind of chilling those days anyway so you don't really feel like you're, you'll are you be missing out. And the funny thing was when I went there, people who were from pretty much every other country said Australia was so expensive, um, which it is expensive to compare it to a lot of other countries, but compared to California at least, it's actually cheaper. Um, than a lot of places in California. To give you a frame of reference, everything that I did, everything that I booked with Welcome to Travel, which all those things that I went through, and there's even a couple more that I don't that I didn't mention. This includes accommodation, um, all of the like excursions and trips and camps that I did, the Greyhound bus pass, all of that together, it was about two-ish months, cost me $5,600 in Australian money. So that's under $4,000 US, which is a lot of money, but considering all the things I, I did, it was not actually an insane amount. And then things I had to spend on top of that was pretty much just food. Okay, we're finally on the last section, and this is all about uh, job search. So after I did my whole trip up the East Coast, ended in Cairns, it was time to look for a job. And a lot of people who had the same visa that I did were looking for regional work jobs, because if you get your 88 days of regional work, that means you can stay for an extra year in Australia. And even if people didn't want to stay for that year, at that time, they wanted to complete those 88 days so that they could come back to Australia and stay a year and work in the future. So you can use that anytime up until you're 30 or 35 if you're a Brit. However, for me, I didn't feel like I necessarily needed to stay an extra year and I kind of wanted to do something that was a bit more up my career path. And so I actually started applying to some marketing based jobs and some online work. And this problem I had was that my visa only allows me to work with one employer for six months. So I was competing against Australians who didn't have any restrictions on their employment. So it was uh, a challenge to find jobs that would even interview me. And I, I realized I would actually have a lot easier time finding a job and making more money back if I did it back home than if I did it in Australia. After like a month of searching and looking for jobs and figuring out what I wanted to do, I ended up going back home. But that's not to say that you can't find a skilled-based job because I know there's some people who did it. If you do like project-based work, say you're a graphic designer or you're maybe um, a developer or something like that and you can do project-based work, that would be really good. I know people who had success finding hospitality jobs and farm work jobs and things like that. To get your 88 days, you just have to be working in a regional area. So you don't actually have to do farm work. You could do hospitality work in a regional area. Casual jobs and hospitality jobs are very seasonal. So when I first got to Australia, which was in February, a lot of people were telling me it's really, really easy to find a job. The reason why was because all of the backpackers were traveling because the weather was perfect for traveling. So finding work would have been really easy in February. But by the time I ended my travels in May, it was really hard for a lot of backpackers to find work because they were competing against all the other backpackers who ended their travels in May. Not to say that it's impossible because I know a lot of people who were able to find jobs in May. If you're worried about finding a job, I would almost recommend to look for work in the busiest tourist season when all of the backpackers are traveling and not competing for jobs, which would be February, March, and April, and September, October, November maybe. I would also recommend going to big cities for work. I tried to find work in Noosa and it was really challenging, but if you went to you know Melbourne or Sydney or uh, Brisbane, 
I'm sure you would be able to find work. You can also try and work in hostels and they'll often give you free stay. There's some people I know who were au pairs. If you end up booking with Welcome to Travel, they also have a job board and they send out weekly emails of jobs that are um, hiring. So that's also something that's really helpful. It's a great resource. Another thing that's huge is connections actually mean a lot. So when you're working your way up the East Coast, staying in hostel to hostel and you know you might want to find a farm job after that, talk to people about that. You might be able to find a group of people who are all looking for farm work together and then one of them finds a job that has like five openings and then you can fill in one of those openings. Um, or maybe you might make a connection with someone else who knows someone who knows someone who is hiring for this position that you wanted. So make sure to just to talk to people and make those connections because it really helps down the line. Um, another thing that really helps is joining Facebook groups and job posting boards. There's even backpacker job boards where people post jobs that are specifically targeted for backpackers because that is a huge population of who makes up um, a lot of the hospitality work in Australia. But if that's what you're set out to do and you're set out to work and find a job, make some resumes, print them out, go door to door and you'll find something. Just like don't give up. Everyone says that solo traveling changes you as a person. I don't really think I'm a different person than who I was before I left. I still do pretty much the same things and I'm living in the same place, um, but I think that my perspective of the world has changed, my understanding of myself has changed, and I just feel like a more complete person. The thing is, you don't need this video. This video is not so you can plan your entire trip because you shouldn't plan your entire trip. You should have an idea of what you want to do and then just, just effing go for it. You'll come out at the very least stronger because of it with some probably awesome stories to tell. So that's been my journey. I really, really hope this video helps you out. Leave me a comment down below um, if you have any questions because I'm here, I wanna help the way that I can. I have all the resources that I mentioned in the video also linked down below, all the stuff about Welcome to Travel. If you are interested in booking with them, I have their discount code also linked down below. And subscribe if you wanna see more videos from me. I try to make cool videos, so subscribe if you want to and I will see you guys in another video. Bye.